Hello and welcome back to Interjections. We've got a loaded episode today. We've got Monza. We've got Manchester City. I'm your host, Andrew. We've got Miko, Irfan, and Jay with me. Irfan, rough weekend for you, man. How are you holding up? Uh, doing all right. Doing all right. Um, came ready to provide a uh, stunning defense of Aslani today, um, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, but yeah, not, not, not a great sports weekend for sure. Miko, you're providing more proof that people don't actually work in Finland. So what's up? Uh, pretty good, pretty good. I'm I'm calm, and the team team is marching towards the Scudetto with conviction. So let's get on with it. I didn't realize you're a Napoli fan, Miko. Jay, how's it going? <laughs> um, I'm doing fantastic. I'm doing really well. Did you guys notice that my hot betting tip of Empoli nil, Juventus nil came to fruition as expected? as did Milan's trashing of Venezia, as did our slip-up against Monza. So, you know. was, it for, was it first time ever? Well, the <laughs> betting, hot betting tip has been correct. <laughs> <laughs> Potentially, but look, that's beside the point, okay? No, but, I mean, we dropped points against a real shitty opponent. I mean, I remember you guys discussing at length last week about how Monza had a combined XG of one over like three games, only for us to concede. And then, of course, Milan won and Arsenal won, so it was a disgraceful weekend for the world of sports. Uh, But no more time to waste, unlike Inter. Let's get into it. You talk about Monza having such low XG yesterday their XG were still a 0.1, and yet we still managed to draw them, which is a truly impressive feat by Inter. I think we have to start with this match by talking about Nzagi's decision and approach. It it might be worth acknowledging that it seems like we're going all in on the Champions League this year. I say that because of this lineup decision from Nzagi. He benches three of our key players bastoni barella and hakan he leads the regular starting lineup in attack pavar plays devry and acherby are pretty interchangeable but he, he makes revolutionary changes in the midfield by starting as Lonnie and fertese and frankly you could tell we were not starting our regulars in the midfield and the the fall off in quality between the first unit and the second unit was horrible And I'm not sure if you can chalk this up to an individual match. I don't know if you can chalk this up to just the actual players themselves or just that much significantly worse. But it wasn't pretty. We couldn't control the game. We didn't have a shot on goal until way, way, way late in this match. Of course, we went behind early. So I need to start with someone objective. I need to start with Miko and say, Miko, what did you think of this decision by Nzagi to rest a significant amount of starters for a game on Wednesday against Manchester City that's I'm, I'm making this a loaded question but honestly what's our chance of beating Manchester City 10% 15% so what do you think of Inzaghi kind of going all in for that match yeah I think I think it was at least a surprise to this podcast as I remember we we all thought about that he's gonna go all in with the full starting lineup or at least most of it, uh, and by most of it, I I assume it always means that there's Chalhanoglu and, and Barella starting because they are so important uh, for this team. But yeah, I don't know. I think this this match at least proves proves that may, maybe the depth is not so great, at least in midfield uh, for us because I don't know. It's just, it, it was just bad, terrible match. Like, can't can't get away with it. Uh, even Mkhitaryan, he had a, not, not a good game at all. And like by his usual standards, he was he was bad and was sub, subbed out because he, <laughs> uh, which is pretty rare, rare occasion that Inzag actually takes Mkhitaryan out. But maybe he was saving him for the city, <laughs> city so... <laughs> <laughs> so so we don't know maybe he plays 90 minutes against City then but yeah I don't know it was just bad we, we didn't have a clear answer how to how to go through the against the like through, through the monster defense they, they defended well we, we need to give credit to them they defended 
like as a, as a proper unit and uh, we just couldn't get through it. Okay, we had some some so-so chances in the first half, those few headers, but uh, nothing, I don't know. It, it wasn't like, it wasn't enough. We, we would have needed more of those like pretty low, low, low XG chances if we wanna if we wanna use that kind of a uh, term to to be able to to be able to cr get more goals like oh, more goals even one goal because that that usually changes the match so much when, when we score the first goal uh, yeah it was bad so if you zero in on two specific players who are catching heat for this performance it's for Tazy and Aslani for Tazy had numerous chances around the box and he could just couldn't get the ball on net he, he i think he had hit the bar sent the ball over the net he, he just couldn't get going which was disappointing after he looked so good for italy last weekend and then as lani i don't know what to say about this guy he just looks like he's a step below the quality of the other players in the squad and i'm trying not to overreact to one game but the the more I watch this guy, the more I think he's just playing the wrong position and he's too slow on the ball to be playing this as a Regista. So, Irfan, I know you're the biggest Aslani fan, possibly in the Inter community, at least on this podcast. What did you see yesterday? And obviously, you're not willing to throw in the towel yet, but what do you need to see improved going forward? Yeah, I mean, look, let's let's. It's obviously an emotional time whenever we lose or we get a draw, but let's go to the let's go to the stats and let's look at like what the more objective community is talking about. So, we had 16 shots to Monza's five. We had two on target, just like Monza. We had 61 percent percent possession to their 39 percent. We also had eight corners uh, with to their one. So. None of these stats speak to me that we had a problem with our deepest lying midfielder. It wasn't a Regista issue yesterday. And in fact, if you look at any match ratings that you can find online for any source, you'll see that Aslani was actually rated higher than every interplayer other than Augusto, whose rating probably went up higher after he had that critical assist. Um, and then Dumfries, who came on later, um, and scored the winning goal, so of course he would have a higher rating. Um, and DeMarco. DeMarco and Augusto were the only starters who were rated above uh, Aslani. So this is a, you know, we we tend to do this as fans. Like, we, we create this, like, scapegoat, and then we just hammer on the scapegoat the whole time. Aslani's honestly become that scapegoat. I'm not saying that because I'm just his fan. The, the problem yesterday was not a problem of the regista it might have been a problem with the midfield but to sit there and not look at how horrible mkhitaryan played who should have been better who's a veteran who should not have any like you know uh benefit of the doubt on the team and then on top of that for tezzy who every time he starts he plays poorly for us and we can't like have a conversation about that instead everyone wants to talk about aslani 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 he f played his role perfectly fine it wasn't stellar it wasn't amazing. He's not Hakan. There's no doubt about that. But when you look at what happened yesterday and you're picking out Aslani, that's weak in my opinion. I just don't see how Aslani was the problem yesterday. There were so many other issues in our attack, not to mention the fact that Lotaro still hasn't scored, scored a goal. And then we had a bunch of shots that were all off target. We were generating fine against a defense that was sitting back. So again, I, and then we gave up a cheap goal, a goal that happened, by the way, when Aslani was off the field, uh, where uh, Zelinski was slow to close down the cross coming in from the midfield. And then Pavar got out jumped by the guy. And again, we're sitting here having a conversation about Aslani. So uh, frankly, it's just, it's, it's low hanging fruit because he's, he's a, he's the youngest player on our team. And yeah, there's definitely a drop off after you take off a con and you put on Aslani, but to pretend that Aslani was the problem yesterday or in most of the matches he's played, is just ridiculous to me. I, I don't, I don't understand that logic and I don't know what people are watching. Yeah. I don't know, Arfan. I think people were upset because we looked horrible and we played our reserve lineup. And you look at the two most critical reserves who played, it was the midfield. It was for Tizi and Aslani. 
And when you lose a match, people are going to point fingers. But I, I still don't think as Lonnie passed the eye test yesterday, I still don't think he looked well. I'd say Fratezi was a bigger problem than as Lonnie, to be honest, in terms of poor performance. Fratezi was wasteful. Fratezi wasn't able to retain possession, lost the ball numerous times. Jay, blame game. Fratezi or Aslani, who had the worst game? You know, I came in here ready to ready to give Aslani a good licking, but uh, I got to say, Irfan's impassionate defense has pulled at my heartstrings a little bit, so I'm going to increase my match rating for Aslani from a 1 to a 2. No, I, I, I joke. Uh, I agree that there's a significant drop-off, obviously, and, um, you know, I'm arguably the biggest Aslani critic here, at least. And at the same time, I do think I find as a point, it was a, I think just a top to bottom failure all around. I think the the the, the lineup was, was really strange. And I'm going to start from the back line before I move forward because I, I find like, I think I'm like the only one kind of harping on about this, but why did we play both Augusto and DiMarco? for 90 minutes like why did bastoni not play bastoni didn't even go to international duty and we've got he did two... he did go he, he played did he? yeah he played 90 minutes in both matches did he yeah well, barella's the one who didn't travel you're right um yeah yeah, yeah, yeah bastoni Bast- started both games for italy he did but so did demarco demarco started both games as well and he played I think 80 minutes, 82 minutes in the first game and 70 something minutes in the second game. So, you know, we're talking not a significant difference in minutes played here between Bastoni and DiMarco. And, you know, I think it's pretty fair to uh, to argue that DiMarco probably expends a lot more energy than Bastoni, given the nature of his position, given the nature of his play style. And I'm sure if you measured those those fucking metrics like how many sprints they went on and that kind of thing. I'm sure DeMarco probably beats out Bastoni as well, obviously given his role. But point is, I don't see why we, again, ahead of two massive games against City and Milan, two games that have the potential to define the season, regardless of how early it is, why did we go out and pump 90 minutes into both our starting or into both our left backs? Now we've got DeMarco heading into Man City and Milan having played 90 minutes against Monza, and his backup has also played 90 minutes. So meanwhile, you've got Bastoni on the bench who could have uh, been really useful this game. So that choice from Inzaghi uh, kind of didn't sit well with me. As for the midfield, I agree that <sighs> Fratesi is not shaping up as well as I'd hoped in his inter career. He really does seem to only shine when brought on to score a goal and he's obviously got a great knack for that but whenever he is given a starting opportunity you know he can't seem to really to grab it with both hands and there was all this noise about Fratesi kind of whether implicitly or 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 otherwise kind of demanding a starting role from Inzaghi Um, and again this is the kind of performance he puts in like there were large stretches of the match where I didn't see him for like 20 minutes at a time, you know? And on top of that, he was roaming, I feel, a bit too much rather than staying where he needed to be and helping us cycle the ball and maintain possession. So as much as I tend to criticize Aslani, there's no question he wasn't helped out by Fratesi and both of them fall into this really uncomfortable kind of space where they're they need to have their hands held by better players. I was just talking about this the other day, but they need to be shielded and supported by more experienced, more capable players like Chelanolu, or namely Chelanolu and Barella, who can who can kind of shoulder more of the responsibility and shoulder the burden of having to kind of do more for a weaker or more, less experienced teammate. And without that, the midfield kind of falls apart. And I don't think Fratesi and Aslani can be really started to, sorry, can be really um, trusted to start together. It reminds me of when Inzaghi would throw out the fucking Aslani, Klaas, and Fratesi midfield here and there last season. You know, it's, you can't do that. It's like if you've got a player who's such a big drop off the way Fratesi is to Barella, the way Aslani is to Chalanolu, you can't put two of them in together. You need to have 
like a, a pillar there to hold up, you know, the, the foundation or the roof. Um, if you're going to replace the other pillars with with weaker supporting uh, structures, so yeah, the decision to start both of them together was confusing. Again, I understand Inzaghi wants Barella fresh for Man City. Sure, that's fine, but Barella didn't go on international duty, and yes, he had a, a surgery on his nose, but by all accounts, it seemed a pretty minor one. I think he was in training the whole time. I think he was back in full training the whole time. So I don't see why Brola couldn't start or couldn't at least couldn't at least, you know, come on in like the second half or something. But yeah, all around it was confusing. And I'll just end on the forwards, you know. Um I felt Taram really tried to play it too cute and you know that that that's I don't want to harp on the guy because he's obviously been our best player uh so far, but I, I've, I see that tendency in him sometimes he, where you feel like he doesn't have that kind of ice cold kind of blood and he tends to be a bit too jovial and, you know, he'll miss a chance and kind of like laugh. There's no there's no room for that in in the absolute elite echelon of football. I'm not saying he needs to be a miserable prick, but you know what I'm saying. We just, uh, you'd like to see him touch more focused in times like this. As for Lautaro, I mean, the less said, the better. The guy was borderline invisible, had, I think, one or two headers that he completely missed the target and was otherwise anonymous. And I can't blame him too much because he didn't have too much or rather any significant rest over the season. Oh, sorry, in between the seasons, he went from um, winning the Scudetto straight to the Copa America and obviously... Um, Wait, did he go to Copa America? Yeah, he went to the Copa America and he won the Copa America, you know, playing right to the to the final. But regardless of, of the why, the the result is that now we have a a captain and a star player who is he looks fucking cooked, man. He looks so heavy. He looks so exhausted. I wanna I wanna quickly comment on Lautaro. Uh you you mentioned that we, we don't have these tough matches. Uh, in the schedule and uh and yeah that's true but as we saw Lautaro yesterday how, how poor he really was <laughs> it's like even even Monza match it's a tough match if you are not like on top condition and if you are not ready because then you look like that what Lautaro looked yesterday and I, I saw some I don't know was it a report from Sky that when there was uh there was earlier predictions or reports that who's gonna start it's gonna be Taremi and Turam and then in the end it was Lautaro yeah how 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 it was reported that okay Lautaro is ready he, he he's ready to start and like sacrifice or whatever and uh I think if if that's the case and and Inzaghi is like okay well if you say so then then you can start then that that's bad because you need to be sure that you are like on on top condition to start a match because that was that was like really bad by Lautaro yesterday. He had a it looked really like a like a heavy legs on him and I, I don't know it, it was just bad and he was was he subbed out at at uh, hour mark or something when when Inzaghi made the three subs. I think he was there and uh, and yeah that. He shouldn't do that if if he's not ready. That if he is not sure that he's ready to play these games, and it really looked yesterday that he was not ready to play the game because you need to be better than that. That that's for sure. Especially that you you just signed that con- contract that you need to be the the guy who leads the line and and so on. Maybe it's a that, question that, of maturity and you know kind of taking that rest when you when you need it even if you're you know obviously wanting to help the team out and and be there as the leader and all that kind of stuff sometimes you got to know when to to take a sick day you know what i mean it's it, if it's better yeah. for long term kind of thing yeah yeah i also just want to quickly address the ridiculousness of andrew's statement when he said inzaghi's gunning for the champions league i'm really prioritizing the champions league this time who the fuck are we to be to be doing that right now i don't think we're in any position to be contemplating you know competing for the champions league we're not regulars at the you know the deep end of the champions league yes we made it to a final yes we narrowly lost thanks to one man and one man only named Romelu Lukaku but still we've all discussed numerous times how 
the run to that final was extremely fortuitous given the the weak opponents that we played along the way and the fact that we faced a an opponent who we regularly beat in Milan in the semifinals. But realistically, I don't think we have that that pedigree, that experience of competing year in, year out in the deep end of the pool to really say that, you know, oh, this year let's make a run for the Champions League. I think that's a little bit, I don't know, it's <laughs> honestly a bit preposterous to me. Do you disagree with the premise, though, that that appears to be what we're doing this year? I do. Um, I don't think... Like I, I think Inzaghi's out of his fucking mind if that's what his, you know, Inzaghi or Morota or anyone at the club has completely lost their fucking marbles if that's what they're thinking. You know, this year let's let's make a push for the Champions League. I respect the 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 ambition, but you can't fucking say let's go for the Champions League and then buy absolutely no one and then blow what is to us a huge budget, but what is to everyone else a pittance of fifteen million on a, on some fucking bum uh, reserve keeper. Like, that that's not Champions League contending shit. It really isn't. You know, you you see the types of players that the Champions League winners and the Champions League competitors have, and the type of players that they're signing. I mean, Real Madrid, Mbappe. You know, who'd they buy before that? Bellingham for 118 million euros. You know, I'm not saying we need to do that, and because obviously that's not realistic and won't be realistic for the next 50 years, but. You get what I'm saying? I don't think you can really go out and sign some some 30 rolls on free transfers and sign some no-name kid from Argentina for $6 million and then sign a mediocre 25-year-old backup keeper and then, you know, and, and then say, I'm, I'm going to compete for the Champions League. It's, it's like showing up to the F1 Grand Prix with like some fucking done-up Commodore and then being like, yeah, let, let's fucking go, boys. I'm here to win. It, it's, it's a bit of a... You know, I respect the 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 cojones, but again, it's just the. I think it's a wildly, what's the word I'm looking for? Just unrealistic kind of ambition to have. Yesterday was a good demonstration of the difference between what Inzaghi wants and what Oak Tree wants. When you look at this waste of money on Palacios, Jay, you you mentioned having to start a gusto and. Realistically, who else are you starting at left center back, right? You're, you know Inzaghi's not playing this Palacios kid. You could kick a Cherubi out left, but we know that's a disaster. If you had, and I'll keep beating this dead horse, if you had Hermoso, he'd be a natural slot in where you put a guy in. And sure, it's a step down from Bastoni, but it's not a significant step down from Bastoni. You feel comfortable with it. Instead, you deploy both your left wing backs on the pitch for the majority of the game. Now they're both tired going into two big matches against Manchester City and Milan. And it's just, there, there's the disconnect between what Inzaghi wants to do and what Oak Tree wants to do. And this is why we're going to pay for the price for it due to this fixture compression. Precisely. And, let, let, and let's, be, say, let's be real. Um, let's, let's be real. Uh, do, you, do you guys think that Hermoso would have done anything to, to yesterday's match? Like he, he would have been the deciding factor here, here or what, what's that? It's no, not about, it's not about that. It's about the it's about the overall long term security that the backups, well, having proper backups who aren't like, you know, dropping off a cliff level of quality. You know, the the security that that provides us. Hermoso is a seasoned veteran in his prime, uh, with vast uh, title contending Champions League contending experience, and Augusto but- is a fullback being played out of position. It's it's. I don't think but it's her- night and day. But Hermoso ended, so ended up to Rome. He ended up to Rome at the like a last last day signing, or was it like after the deadline or something? Yeah, like- I don't disagree. He was asking for too much money, Miko. Hopefully, you could be able to sort that out on negotiations. But I think it's a broader point of we just had to stretch our squad thin ahead of two of the most important matches of the season. And it's yes. a direct result of not having the appropriate depth in the squad. We do not have someone who can realistically play behind Bastoni without depleting our left wing back because we're, we're just missing a sub on the left-hand side. And Oak Tree's solution of Palacios is going to be lucky to see five matches this season. Uh, yeah, and I just want to uh, say, in, in Zalke himself is not blameless either because, again, I keep pointing this out, and we've talked about this numerous times, how he always takes Bastoni off and puts a Cherby on the left center back position. Like, why does he need to rotate a 25 year old so much? You know, um, 
sometimes at the at the favor of keeping on a 35 year old it just doesn't make sense and not just Bastoni but Bissek has played in that left center back position prior to joining Inter but again Inzaghi just like he's doing this disservice to Aslani he's pigeonholing players in in these roles and is so wildly unwilling to to experiment with them like Aslani I don't think has ever played outside of that central um playmaker position I don't think we've ever seen him as one of the the LCM or the RCM likewise I don't think Bissek has ever played other than the right center back position and yeah, I, I really think Inzaghi isn't a hundred percent blameless in this in this situation either. I think, given the constraints, like if he really doesn't want to play Palacios, he's got to come up with a bit more creativity sometimes. And that might be to play Bissek on the left. That might be to to start Bastoni and give him you know strictly fifty five minutes or whatever if he's so concerned about him. You know, again, a twenty five year old centre back like becoming exhausted. How much running do centre backs do? You know, compared to a fucking compared to a a five foot three left wing back who has to, you know, take a hundred steps to move 30 meters, you know, cause his legs are so short. It's again, I, I just think Nzagi could have done 5% more to, to aid us in this tight situation. Well, look, one, one thing Nzagi definitely needs to stop doing is this, uh, Mkhitaryan, Aslani, Fratezi midfield. Um, going back for a second to Aslani, um, he he started six matches for us in Syria last year. Out of those six, we won five of them. We lost one. The one we lost was to Sassuolo, and it, it featured the same midfield that we saw yesterday. Um, and in those six matches, he had two assists and a goal. So, again, I, I think the bigger problem with our midfield is what happens when Barella's not playing. Because when Barella and Aslani play, we almost don't skip a beat. As much as I still admit that Aslani is a drop off to uh, Hakan, there's no doubt about that. But I think not playing Barella yesterday was probably the seminal mistake that uh, Inzaghi made, uh, especially because Barella didn't even play in the um, in the in the international break. He didn't even travel. So it, again, we we've talked a little bit about whether or not he's prioritizing the Champions League over the league and whether that's a problem or not. But on a go forward basis, I could care less what happens with Manchester City if we have some sort of depleted squad or we try to experiment with the midfield or the back line against Milan. Because right now we're in that mode, we're in that period of time where Lataro's not clicking for whatever reason. And so we have to kind of survive until he starts his, you know, hot streak. And it's already been like a month where he has not scored for us. And so we have to be really like smart and tactical about the league here and not like waste all our chances on trying to like upset Manchester City in Manchester. Yeah, uh, I was about to make a point uh, for the depth depth issue that I don't think our depth should be a problem at match day four against Monza. Like our rota- rotation should be like it should be acceptable and it should be like smart to rotate at in a match like this. I think the issue is that we we just don't, or how do I say this? Maybe Insagi needs to do more. Like if he doesn't have Barella on the pitch, we we need to we need to play differently. And yesterday it looked like we all all the all the players play like there's there's Barella or or like <laughs> how do you say it? All the players ex, uh, like expect that there's something's going to happen soon. When Aslani has the ball in the like in in midfield, and everyone is just waiting, waiting, and usually there's also Barella roaming around and uh, fetching the ball and making things happen. And with Fratesi, it's much less of that. And I think that that's that's an issue with the coach. I think because we can't play play Barella in every match. We we know that, and. And the rotation that that's ne- that needs to happen. We, we can't do this season like we did last season. We last season we clearly made the made the decision that okay we're gonna go with the Scudetto. We we rotated in the Champions League uh, when we secured the knockout stage. We immediately like put the uh, put the bench players against Benfica away. We remember that match, 
and uh, and this season it look like it looks like Inzaghi maybe with the management has, has made the decision that okay now we're gonna rotate and we 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 need to manage the season from the start so that the players won't uh, they are ready in the spring as well but I don't think we we are like heading or or tar- targeting like a, some like some fi- final in the Champions League or anything like that. I think we are still uh, in a situation that okay, we need the knockout round, all the money from there, maybe quarterfinals. That that's a lot of money, uh, and uh, and all all after that, it's just a bonus. But but I think Inzaghi needs to do more here so that he enables us to play effectively and, and like win matches without Barella playing. And yes, we did that last season as well. I assume, I haven't checked any stats. I think Barella played most of the matches uh, or played part, part at least. Uh, but but we, we, need to, we need to find ways to play without him anyway. Because there's yeah. so many matches. Yeah. No, and, and I'll just say one last thing about, like, you know, we were talking about the eye test and, and all this sort of stuff. So so one thing I've harped on consistently, probably in every episode of Interjections, is how dynamite that connection between DeMarco and Bastoni is and how much offense gets generated between those two um, at Inter. And the other kind of, you know, duo that generates a lot of our offense is the Hakan Barella duo. And so he, he Inzaghi has to realize that you got to put at least one of those two out there. Like if you're going to start, if you're not going to start um, uh, Bastoni, then you better start Barella and Hakan. And if you're not going to start uh, Barella or Hakan, then you better start Bastoni and, and DeMarco. Or if you're not going to start Bastoni, then like, you know, you, you need either Barella or Bastoni out there, I think at, at all given times, if you're trying to generate offense or sometimes you can get away with a con, but it just, it doesn't work when you've taken both of those kind of um, duos off of the pitch. It's, it's just not, it's not sustainable for us as good as Augusto did with DeMarco. If you had Bastoni out there, like uh, I think Jay said, even for like the first 55 minutes, I think this game could have been completely different. So he, you know, he, you can't shoot both of our feet off at the same time. You got to at least put like one, foot on on the pedal at some point and try to like get out there and score score a goal um and also like putting Dumfries on so late again there's a lot of mistakes I think and and a lot of them I think were on Inzaghi yesterday I think he typically underestimated this match and didn't give it the importance that it deserved there was one Inzaghi decision yesterday that really irked me more than any of the other ones and that was his substitutions in the 75th minutes when he completely broke the team's shape took off Aslani and made the double move of putting on Arnautovic and Correa. So we had three strikers on the pitch. Just a laughable decision. Correa is nothing as a player. It broke formation. We immediately conceded. It was like five minutes after he made that change, we got caught on the counter. It was his worst decision of the match, and it's the biggest reason we conceded a goal yesterday. This is the second time he's done this this season. The first time it paid off when he went to Taremi to ram Lataro together, I believe, earlier in the season. But when you do it with Arnautovic, Taremi Correa, like it's just a joke, man. Like you cannot be doing that when you are in a tie match. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I just, I, I don't like Correa at all, and uh, I don't think no, 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 no Inter fan likes him at this point anymore. And I was, I'm always like, okay, we have. These are the Inter players, so I always support them and, and everything. Uh, but when I when I see Correa on the beach, and I was like, okay, he is he's running there. He is he isn't like he's he's losing balls. He he gets some passes, but then when he's off the ball, like it's it makes me mad when he doesn't like run. He doesn't press. He he hasn't played like a minute in this season, and he just can't fucking do anything of the ball he just can't press and it's so it's so frustrating to watch that uh i i remember a- end of like like really late la- in, in the in the monster monster match th- there was like a huge area on the left side and korea was just 
he was walking in the midfield uh, following b- ball was on the on the our, our right side and then it was cycled on the left and he, he was just choking there a bit and I was looking like five seconds earlier that you should cover you should cover that area like <laughs> you should you should do something uh, meaningful and he, he's just he's just so useless useless there uh, of the ball that it's just I, I can't do it I can't do it uh, this is a rough podcast for the you guys are too negative crowd but right, we're doing what we can let's get into the city match so big first champions league match having to travel to manchester of course with the milan derby looming it is worth pointing out that city played this weekend they played their full strength lineup it appears and they also have arsenal next weekend so probably their most important match at the start of the premier league season so they're in a very similar fixture congestion as us the difference of course is that they have double double the squad quality due to him having quadrupled the squad budgets there's i don't know how you're supposed to look at this match obviously we'll be playing our full strength starting 11 there's not really any start sit decisions to analyze i would just say this is going to be an incredibly difficult match to win unless one of or not both lotaro and taram come ready to play and lotaro looks something like he did last season jay has a devout premier premier league fan how do you feel about this match going into it terrible i don't think we have much chance at all to be honest i think some people might take a bit of offense to this but i think it depends more on them than it does on us i think if they show up we don't really have much say in the matter i think in games like this like the the way that they won the champions league final uh two years ago is the perfect indication of the difference between the two teams at the end of the day they had one guy who had enough quality and and balls and mentality to score a out of the box curler in a champions league final in the biggest game of his life and we didn't it's that simple instead we had some fuckwit getting in the way of his teammates and blocking goals and stuff like this you know just a just a s tier choker in lukaku and obviously we're free of lukaku now but ultimately the overall point still stands where I th- and this is just one of my kind of crazy theories and ways of seeing things that i have but i really do believe there is like a certain um a certain like you know they, they say he's a player for the occasion or whatever the saying goes i think that really does hold true when you look at the champions league there are players who rise to these big occasion than uh, big occasions and there are players who have limits to how far they can rise and i'm yet to see many of our players if any show that they can or rather convince me that they have what it takes to to go out and make the difference in a game like this you know in enemy territory against a team that has the mental advantage over us having defeated us in the champions league final obviously on paper they are vast favorites if if DiMarco or Chalanolu gets a chance to shoot from 25 meters out and sure these some of these things come down to luck as well but do they have the metal to put that ball into the top corner or are they going to, you know, get distracted and put it into Rosette or whatever it is, you know? Likewise, if Lataro or Tarama rounded through on goal, through a nice combination of passes and then one-on-one with Edison, are they going to bury that in the net or are they going to choke? We don't know at this point. And like I said, I don't think history is on our side in that regard. So, yeah, I really think as as somewhat depressive as it is to say that I don't think we have much say in the matter. If they show up, I don't think we can do a lot. If they don't, then we might have a bit of a chance. But otherwise, you know, we're going to have to really pull something out of the hat here, really get everything right from the tactics to the lineup to the mentality and uh, the intensity and all the the minutia of the fine details, you know, is what if DeMarco gets across marginally wrong? What if Varela takes one touch too many and then he doesn't get a chance to get a shot off or whatever it is you know what i'm saying it all comes down to these tiny tiny details sometimes in games like this and i just think their players or they have more players who have proven track records of getting those tiny details right you know as opposed to some of our guys so i think if i had to give like odds to it i'd say it's like uh i don't know 
honestly reckon it's like a 80 percent likeliness that they'll win probably like a 10 percent chance or 15 percent chance that we might be able to scrape a draw but uh yeah i really really do not fancy our chances of 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 winning here and uh, i'm sorry that sounds horrendously depressing but that's just the way i see it Irfan, does this game matter like at the end of the day we're supposed to lose the city there was eight games in this new champions league format in the the league stage if you take a scheduled loss here it probably doesn't hurt your chances of getting out of the group especially as a away fixture but like when you look at you want to win you want to look good against europe's elite like does this game matter for you no i was gonna say in in the wise words of a great man i know this is a budgeted loss there, there's there's no reason for us to go out there and put anything out there like no one's going to be impressed. Honestly, even if we were to scrape out a win or to somehow get a draw, none of these EPL fanboys would give us any credit. No one would care. Like it's just one of those things where there's not much of a benefit. Like look, if we were facing these guys in the knockout round or or you know, the final, then yes, I would say put your best foot forward, put it all on the line and 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 go in and try to win as much as you can. But this match, I mean, playing them at their home, the first Champions League game, I, I could honestly care less. And I'm not even saying that as a coming from a position of like weakness, knowing that, you know, giving, throwing in the towel or pretending like, uh, you know, we, I'm just, I'm saying I'm not trying to come at this from a negative point of view. But, but the fact is, like, if you just play the numbers game, they're a good team that has way mo- way better players and spends way more money than us. I'm all for taking a shot, but we're not in good form right now either. Like it's not like, you know, we're clicking on all cylinders and we really want to put on a show and show the world what we're capable of. I mean, we've not played that great this whole season and some of our best players are underperforming. So I could care less about this match. Whatever happens happens. I honestly I would not have risked what we risked against Monza and I definitely would not risk anything against Milan like if you're telling me that any kind of formation we put out there against Manchester City any player selection would result in anything other than our best 11 playing against Milan I would say hell no play whatever you need to play but on when we play Milan we need to be able to start all 11 of those guys without excuses I want to comment a bit about that That, that's a bit too much of defeatism <laughs> for my liking. I mean, yeah, maybe the chances are not great for us to win the match. Like you said, it, it's true. This this match, it's maybe it doesn't matter in the standings. It's it's a pot a pot one opponent away. So that's maybe the that's maybe the number one budget that loss if if anything. But but still, it's it's a Champions League and. Of course, Inzaghi can't can't tell the squad. Okay, we're gonna rotate here in this in this absolute top top match because uh, blah, 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 whatever therapy, whatever. I don't think I don't think players would would take that like okay, okay, boss. Uh, because the players play for these matches. They play because they can play the Champions League and the and the matches against the best players. So of course. We are going to play the best play- players in this match, and uh, I don't think Insag is going to rotate on Sunday in the derby. We played last season. We played many many times that we we used most of the starters or or maybe the full starting lineup like in a two matches in a row, and it, it didn't affect too much our our performance. And especially now it's early in the season i think it's it's totally totally fine starting uh starting the the best players in, in these two matches and uh, i believe that that's going to happen unless unless there's some injuries on on or something else and uh as for the for the chances yeah may, maybe they are not great it's the away match city hasn't lost at home for for quite some time I, I don't remember the record but it was it was like it was quite many matches but I, I, I would take the draw if if someone offered it to me now so that that that's fine that's fine if if you can take a draw from this match it's okay uh, I think the 15 points is the target 
we, we should be looking for in the Champions League. That's probably is going to take us to take us to the best eight. So so draw here. That that would be nice. Uh, but but like you said, like you guys said, the result it 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 doesn't really matter. But I would have liked this match to be like on the other side of the schedule, so that there would have been like a maybe different different kind of uh, conditions or or like maybe city would have been rotating more or, or anything but now now it's the first one so they're gonna they're gonna really really come at us hard but let's see I, i'm 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 like cautiously hopeful that we, we're gonna play totally different game than what we saw yesterday nico you make a great point in that I think there's a disconnect between how we view this game and how the players view this game. I just think about a few years ago when we had a completely meaningless win against Liverpool where Liverpool wasn't even trying for half the match. And after the season, you had Handanovic highlighting that as one of the great moments of the season. How oh, we beat Liverpool. There's a European pedigree here. Players want to play in these games. Players want to win these games. So maybe that is part of the reason why Inzaghi is truly going for it here when we'll be rolling out a full starting strength 11. I just think it's ill-advised when you consider how many factors are working against us. I read a stat that City haven't lost at home in like 32 consecutive matches or something like that. It's just, this is a true, true mountain of a test. And if we manage to get any points, I'll be pretty impressed. I think those were 30 two or 31 Champions League games as well. So, you know, when you consider how many Champions League games are in a season that stretches back to what, five years ago, four years ago, it's, it's wow. an insane record. On that optimistic note, let's get some predictions in here. Uh, Irfan, lead us off. Uh, <laughs> man, um, I'm going to go with uh, Manchester City to uh, an inter nil. Miko. Uh, I can't, I can't, I can't predict inter inter losing, so I'm gonna go with two two. <laughs> you are such a homer. <laughs> yeah, I'm totally. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to know who's scoring our two goals, Miko, because I. <laughs> I, I I'm, not gonna, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not gonna tell you. I, I, I'm bad this season with predictions. <laughs> Probably some sure. some old fuck like like an Atavich and Sommer, and an Atavich scores one, and then Sommer goes up for a corner in the ninety sixth minute and scores. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take some it. some pro, some Providel shit. Uh, go ahead. I, I, I concur with Erfan. I actually gave my hot betting tip on this. I think two three weeks ago, and I said the same thing. Two nil, both goals from Holland. I just can't see us um, again. I, I would love nothing more in the world than to be proven wrong um but i just don't see it right now so i don't think we are capable of scoring in an occasion like this on a stage like this i keep talking about stages you know the player for the grand occasion all that kind of stuff and again anything's possible right who knows but just given what we have seen historically from these players in the Champions League in particular uh given what we've seen from this season so far i just don't really think we have that at this point in time that we have the um that that nerve that that metal to go and score some big goals at city so unfortunately i think it'll be a clean sheet for them and i'm gonna go two nil to both goals by harland because he's on some fucking insane tear he's got nine goals in four games <laughs> in the premier league and nine goals in four games so yeah um let's uh let's yeah i'm taking two nil andrew yeah, similar theme. I just don't see us scoring a goal here, especially with with Lataro in such poor form. So I'll take a one nil City. I only say one nil because I think if they get a lead and they feel comfortable in the match, they might make some early substitutes in preparation of the Arsenal match. So I would not be stunned if we scraped a draw here. Like it would not shock me, but I would be absolutely stunned if we won this game. Yeah, I agree on that. I could see us like really shitting our way to like a nil nil, you know. Yeah, like I said, a win just seems unfathomable to me right now. On that optimistic note, 
April wrap up. We're going to be back after the city game. We're going to do a city recap Milan Derby preview. So you can stay tuned for that in a special midweek episode. Hopefully we have some more positive things to talk about midweek. But until then, we'll catch you all later. All right. See y'all. Thanks for listening. Thanks.